Um, again, I, I would like to actually thank a uh, team in Kessler and the Latin America Studies and, and the different programs that actually make this uh, conversation possible. This is a conversation. I want this to be a dialogue, right? I mean, because sometimes it's, it's just not enough just to have one person <laughs> to speak and, uh, and not to really understand what we're talking about, no? Um, yes, I'm the founder of the Border Network for Human Rights. How many of you have been at the U.S.-Mexico border? Raise, raise your hand. Okay. So um, I, I, will, I will talk about a couple of things today. Uh, one of them is about the development and the evolution of border enforcement <laughs> policies and strategies, but also very importantly, to talk about the narrative that is being built in this country towards the border and towards immigrants, because that is extremely important. You heard about the border all the time, right, in the news. It is part of the national discussion. And what I want to challenge you, and probably you know that, that many of those narratives are distorted artificial narratives, that they are being used politically. So I, I'm going to try to actually at least present our vision, I mean, of people working with communities at the border, how our families see the border also, but how ourselves see ourselves, you know? So, but le let me do that. I would like to start with um, a video. This video was produced a year ago. It is not a, it's not a good quality video. I mean, I mean, let me tell you, probably you will do something better, but I think that those were the resources that we had at that time. But uh, that was done to showcase uh, the 20 years of work of Border Network of Human Rights. And, uh, and, and I, I will ask you to do something. Just the video talks about different things that we do. I mean, it's just not one thing. It is multiple things. So actually, if you take note of that and you want to ask questions, um, that'll be fine, okay? So let's, let's, let's do the video. The Border Network for Human Rights, 20 years of organizing and resisting at the U.S.-Mexico border. The Border Network for Human Rights was founded in El Paso, Texas in 1998 by current Executive Director Fernando Garcia. Building on a rich history of local activism around the border and immigration issues, BNHR reframed these efforts through a human rights lens with the goal of building sustainable, organized community power, a community <coughs> structure that would give border residents and immigrant families a voice. BNHR is a human rights organization, not an immigrant rights organization, and aspires to advance the dignity and rights of all persons. Moreover, BNHR works to make material changes to policy and practice centered on empowering affected persons with the skills, organization, and opportunities to participate in such efforts. BNHR's early years focused on community organizing, doing the basic work of educating communities regarding their own human and constitutional rights, and asserting those rights to improve their lives. For 20 years, the vast majority of the organization's resources have been dedicated to building a broad community base. To date, BNHR has trained more than 500 human rights promoters and has organized and integrated close to a thousand families from 40 neighborhoods into human rights committees. These abuse documentation campaigns involving dozens of trained community documenters led into BNHR's El Paso model, a process of dialogue and pressure that brings institutions like the El Paso Police Department, Doña Ana County Sheriff, U.S. Border Patrol, and others to the table to discuss and address the causes of abuses and problems facing area communities. The El Paso Law Enforcement Engagement Model, developed by BNHR, emphasizes community engagement, transparency, and accountability, and has led to real enforcement reforms in our region. In 2012, 
The El Paso Border Patrol sector adopted revised use of force guidelines to increase use of firearms, promoted tactical withdrawal, and emphasized de-escalation. Two years later, the Obama administration used this as the basis for new national use of force policy for CBP. Similarly, the El Paso model has seen communities work with local government and law enforcement to prevent the enforcement of federal immigration laws by local police departments and to promote respect for the human and civil rights of all members of our community. BNHR has been a leader in a number of national efforts. We were a key voice in the room helping to shape the 2006, 2011, and 2013 comprehensive immigration reform packages. Likewise, BNHR has been involved in regional and national efforts, including the Campaign for Accountable, Moral, and Balanced Immigration Overhaul, Cambio, the Human Rights at Home campaign, Hurrah, the New Poor People's campaign, and the New Ellis Island Committee. We are proud to project the voices and experiences of affected communities into national conversations. Among the other equally important highlights of BNHR over the last 20 years are the creation of the Texas Statewide Coalition, Founded in 2009 as a BNHR project, the Reform Immigration for Texas Alliance, RITA, is Texas's leading statewide grassroots alliance of pro-immigrant organizations and allies in the business, religious, and law enforcement sectors. Starting in August 2016, BNHR held the first Hugs Not Walls event denouncing the policy of family separation, giving separated families a few minutes to be together again, and showing America that another moral, humane, inclusive choice is possible for our country. The NHR is fighting in the streets, in Congress and in the courts, unprecedented attacks against immigrants, refugees, and border residents, and denouncing the criminalization and militarization of our communities by the current administration. At the end of the day, the best of America's history of resistance and the values we hold dear will prevail over racism and xenophobia. We will overcome. Ben Serenos, Border Network for Human Rights. Um, that is a, a snapshot of um, <coughs> of our history, obviously there are many, many things that are not covered in that history. But let me start with something. Actually, the video finishes saying that there's an unprecedented attack against immigrants and border residents. And let me put that in context. In the 21 years that we had been working at the border, organizing at the border, doing a lot of advocacy at the border, we had made a lot of progress. And, and, I, and I will talk about that in a minute. But we never seen the, um, a situation like that, an unprecedented situation of attacks against our community. Many bad things happening at the same time at the US-Mexico border. In the past, we will face one situation and then, and then the next one. Actually, the border, it, it, the, the construction of the border has been a, it's, it's been a, a, a center and a half process already. If you remember that the border was essentially created after 1847, uh, after the U.S.-American War, you know, and you and you will you'll know the story about it. I mean, the war with Mexico was the excuse to actually to to implement the Manifest Destiny, the the Monroe Drug Doctrine that actually uh, allow you know the 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 conquest of the West, uh, but also they need to fight with Mexico. They need to create a pretext with Mexico to get more land to go to the West, all the way to California. And then the border was established right after. But the border patrol, I mean, when we start talking about the, the real border, is with the establishment of the border patrol. Do you remember when the border patrol was created? It was the year? Border patrol is, is, is a major historic uh, fact, right? Anybody? 1924. You almost got it. 
Yeah, N 1924. <laughs> 1924. But you know, the Border Patrol. Uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna talk a lot, a lot about it. I mean, the 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 Border Patrol emerged of out of the experience of the Texas Rangers. And the, the, the function of the Texas Rangers uh, after the Mexican-American War was essentially keep Mexicans out of Texas and take their lands and, ter and, and, and take their, uh, actually deport them, sometimes kill them. So I think that is the, the background of the Border Patrol. But at the time of the establishment of the Border Patrol, the concept of the nation towards the border was the concept of border security. I'm uh, sorry, border control. Border control. That means we want to know who is coming in and out. And at that time, you didn't need passports. Between 1920 to 1950 or something, you just need some kind of identification to come through the ports of entry, right? So I think that was the establishment of the border under the idea of border control. Many things were happening at the same time. The Bracero program. Also, the, the wetback operation, operation wetback, which was to report Mexicans and even U.S. citizens that were living in, in the United States back to Mexico, right? But something happened in the early 80s that changed the concept of the border. It was the decision of Ronald Reagan to declare the war on drugs. That was the next philosophical approach to the border, which was going from border control, just to know who was coming in and out, to border security now. Now that meant that every crosser at the border was a potential drug trafficker or drug dealer. So there was a potential criminal crossing. So therefore, let's reinforce the border, let's reinforce the framework and re reinforce the, the, the narrative that this, there's a potential criminal coming through the border. But, th but, but that policy was generalized. I mean, it wasn't just a specific, very focused strategy to say, we're going to go after drug traffickers. We're going to go after everybody. Everybody that crosses the border will be a potential trafficker. And then we saw from the 80s to the 90s, what I call, and I don't know if this is a term, you need to help me with that, a massification of the enforcement. In the past, we have a few hundred agents at the border. By, 20, by, by 1993, we already had 9,000 9, Border Patrol agents close to 10,000. And the strategy was very clear at that time, to seal the border in those traditional crossing points, which are, those were the populated areas, El Paso Juarez, San Diego, Tijuana, Brownsville, Matamoro, and others. And it was very simple, is we're gonna put enough visible agents right, right there at the borderline, so people would see it, so they would not cross there, so that people then would go far away into the desert, and sometimes, and also into uh, isolated areas, that, what they will cross, there will be more dangers, there will be no people to help them, and guess what, they will die. I mean, this operation was, was called prevention through deterrence. I mean, they, they wanted to make it so difficult for immigrants to come to the, to, to the United States that they actually pushed them into these very dangerous areas. The operations, you probably, you know that, you know that already. Right? Operation Blockade, Operation Fall the Line, all of those in El Paso, op Operation uh, Rio Grande in, in the Rio Grande Valley, Operation Guardian in uh, San Diego, Tijuana, Arizona. And guess what? So people start, obviously, start going into the deserts, into the mountains, into isolated places, and people indeed start dying. Since then, since 1993, we had an average of 500 migrants dying per year crossing the border. And when I tell you this, I'm telling you that they, are, they could be my friends, my family members, my uncles, my cousins, my parents. This is very personal. I mean, this is not like... A, this is not happening in Mars, even though they want to call us, call us illegal aliens, right? It is happening right here. Since then, since 1993, we had more than 10,000 migrants that had died in the U.S.-Mexico border due to our formal official policies. That is a catastrophe. That is a human rights crisis. We had had 
more migrants dying in our borders than the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. So how can we allow that? Do we know about it? I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, sometimes you don't know about that situation. Or if they presented that situation to you, they say, well, there's another migrant that died. There was a point that in the Rio Grande Valley and in El Paso, there were, there were bodies floating in the river. And they called them floaters in a very deceptive way. So since 1993, then we start having the seal to seal up the, sealing up the operations, putting more border patrol agents. And in 2001, again, we, we saw another change in the conception of the border. What happened in September 11, the terrorist attack? They said now the border, the US-Mexico border, would not be only about border security, it would be a matter of national security. Now, everybody that, that is crossing the border is not only a potential drug dealer, or drug trafficker, now would be a potential terrorist, right? So the, again, this is the conception, this is the narrative that's been built without, probably without the society knowing what was happening, what, what is what's happening in these success, successive moments was what I call the expansion of the criminalization of immigrants. So immigrants, we're seen as a drug dealers, but also as a potential terrorist. That's why it seems too easy today. It seems too easy, and it's not. It is, it is quite wrong. It has to be questioned. It must be questioned. It must be, those people must be hunt, uh, held accountable. When they call immigrants criminals, rapists, and animals, probably you have heard that in the last few months, it comes out of the construction of this narrative throughout many, many, many years. And some people start believing it, right? Yeah, there is an invasion of immigrants. There is an invasion of criminals. They represent a national security threat. So after 2011, by, 2000 and, by 2000 and, sorry, 2001, by 2005 and 2006, we saw the other, the other element, the other system that was superimposed on the border. It was long constructed, but it was during the 2000s that we saw the expansion of the militarization of the US-Mexico border. So let's call them criminals, but at the same time, let's implement a military strategy to contain them. Border walls. They started in 2005, 2006. Not now. It was, it was back then. And in, in, in both administrations, the, the Democrats and Republicans equally responsible of this narrative. Right? Then we start building border walls. But that was not enough. Border walls. We needed to, to add more border patrol agents. So we went from 10,000 in 1993 to today 23,000 border patrol agents deployed at the US-Mexico border. Border Patrol is, act, is acting, and they consider themselves as a paramilitary unit, not a civilian enforcement, law enforcement agency, a paramilitary unit. That was not enough. It was not enough to put the walls, to increase numbers of Border Patrol. We need to use technology. So we had drone systems. I had the numbers, probably you, got, you, you saw some of the papers. Eight drone systems in the skies. The same drones, uh, drones that are sh launching mi missiles in Afghanistan is the ones that we had there. Within 100 miles from the border into the interior, we have drone systems observing the border, actually up to Disneyland in California. So we had the drone systems. We had sensors, night visions, everything that you, could, you can think of. But that was not enough, again. That was not enough. We need to have more, more border enforcement. Now, we deployed the National Guard in 2005, 2006, 2010, state National Guards. 5,000, up to 5,000, so 5,000 of them. That was not enough. Again, there was not enough to contain the invasion, to contain the enemy. 
we need more. So we did the unprecedented in the last two, when I, when I say we, I mean, I want to say like more in terms of society, I, we didn't do it. The powers to be did it. And in this case, administrations did it, right? Trump declared national emergency, a national emergency, emergency declaration for the border, saying that there was a, an imminent threat, that there was a situation of emergency because of the invasion. And we deployed the unprecedented. And I see the unprecedented because probably you can, some of the professors can tell me if this happened before. We deployed 5,000 active duty soldiers, Marines, within American soil. I, re I recall the deployment of military in the past. I, re I recall Watts. I recall uh, in the South, Alabama, Georgia. But that was in the National Guard. We're talking about battalions of Marines deployed at the U.S. Mexico within the American soil. How many of you know about the Posse Comitatus Act? I know that you know. <laughs> Can you tell us? Okay. The Posse Comitatus Act, it is a very old provision that prohibits the deployment of the army within the American soil for political purposes. It had to be an emergency. An emergency is, is, a, is an internal state of war or a massive cat catastrophe. None of that is happening at the border. But however, we, I, I probably could show you pictures. We have Marines walking in our neighborhoods. Why this is bad? I mean, it's bad because it's violating what I believe constitutional standards. But even beyond that, it's bad because it's setting up a precedent that whatever happens at the border is going to happen in the interior. That's been the history. The, the border always becomes the country. The, it always goes to the interior. Yes, borders define the character of the nation. But also, not only for good, but also for bad. So the distance from having Marines in Chicago, or here, or in New York City, is now this far, because any other president can declare a state of emergency and then have Marines in the streets of Chicago or of Los Angeles. That is very, very, very bad. The Border Network for Human Rights, and I need to be very clear about it, we had filed a lawsuit against the National Emergency Declaration. We right now, we, are, we went to the courts, we're waiting for the ruling. We presented the case already, the administration presented theirs, and we're waiting for the, for, for the judge decision. What is, what is the decision of the judge? We don't know, but we, we make the case already. Okay, so Marines, but that wasn't enough. I mean, again, this is never, never enough. And what we come to observe and to know is that border, the border, and the policies towards the border, the strategies towards the border, they are being politically motivated. Because why? How many of you know of an incident where a terrorist had been detained or stopped crossing the U.S.-Mexico border? Any? None. Zero. None. How many potential terrorists or terrorists had crossed, I'm calling it like that because that's, that's, that's the term that they use, that had crossed the Canadian US border? Some of the 9 11, 11 hijackers. If any of you actually are from the West Side, from Washington State? Washington State. Uh, right after 9-11, uh, there was a, uh, a guy that actually crossed the Canadian border with a truck full of explosives and was aiming towards Los Angeles airport. And they called him, they, they caught him, I mean, thankfully. But he was known as the LA bomber. It was, he, his, his intention was to actually explode that vehicle outside of the airport. 
So why we are not doing the same if the argument is national security? Why we are not putting walls, drones, more border patrol agents? I mean, why we're not, why we're not militarizing the, the Canadian U.S. border? I don't want that to happen. I just put in that in contrast. I mean, if that is the argument, in, in Mexico, the Mexican, the U.S.-Mexico border has not seen an incident like that. The Canadian border has seen an incident like that. However, we are not treating them equally. Why? We're going to talk about that. Why? The fact is that we, at the U.S.-Mexico border right now, we have had one of the most militarized borders in the, in the world. Just right after Korea and South Korea, after Afghanistan and Israel, we had this border. $18 billion spent at border enforcement, $18 billion. What is the intention of that? So is the end, it seems that you're preparing for a war. So who is the enemy in this war? We say that it was drug dealers and drug traffickers. If that was the case, then we lost that war. Because there's more drugs than ever in the country. So we need to accept our defeat. If, that, if we are putting all of that money, all of that infrastructure, well, it is not about drugs. Okay, it is not about terrorists because we have not necessarily seen that pattern of terrorist, terrorism. So what is this about? Who is the enemy? Are we are at war with Mexico? Well, when you start realizing and we start really understanding the situation, you see that the enemy is that immigrant family, that children, the child, that mother that is fleeing violence, persecution, economic depression. Those are the real enemy. So we can now, we cannot ignore now that our border policies, our, our border strat strategies for a while, they are not, not only being infused by politics, because it seems that talking about the border, a bit tough about the border and say, we're going to stop or whatever, gives somebody votes, right? But that is not happening. How they are portraying the border is not happening. So what we are seeing more and more is that border enforcement policies are infused with ideology, with racism, but more specifically with white supremacy. That's why we're not seeing that in, Cana in the Canadian border. We need to accept that reality. Let me give you an, an example of what is, what is El Paso. El Paso is the safest city. It's one of the safest cities in the country. It's, it's a, a, the safest city of people, of cities more, of more than 500,000 people. So that means El Paso is safer than Washington, D.C. <laughs> I would say that there is less crime in El Paso than in the White House. Um, we have a murder rate of between 12 to 15 people dying due to crime a year. A year. Okay, but I was with accumulation of enforcement. The military, that was not enough. Then a few weeks ago, a uh, few, few months ago, March, February, March, we saw the arrival of, of militia groups at the border, armed militia of the border, mostly white, I would say, with a very specific ideology. And they, they were saying that they were coming down to the border. They were responding to the call to action by President Trump to stop the invasion. I mean, it seems that it wasn't enough, right? I mean, I'm telling you, all of the immigration flows, they had reduced, been reduced them dramatically from uh, in, two, in the year of 2000. Actually, in the year of 2010, I'm going to say 2010, the average number of people arrested crossing the border, it was 1.5 million people. 1.5 million people per year. In 2008, I'm going to talk about the refugee crisis in a minute, but 2018, 2018, under 400,000. 
So 1.2 million was were not crossing anymore any longer due to this massive, massive enforcement, obviously, and other factors, economic factors, and economic pushes. But then the narrative that there is an invasion was picked up by people that saw that as an invasion. And because this idea of the invasion, this idea of racism and xenophobia is not new, but, it, but it's coming from the highest office of the nation, from the White House. So obviously some people responding to it went down to El Paso and they start militias with no authority to, to arrest anybody. They start detaining people crossing the border and calling border patrol. I mean, they were an extension of that, right? <coughs> But I say that because I move forward uh, some months, August the 3rd, El Paso, Texas. August the 3rd, El Paso, Texas, somebody drove 600 miles from northern Texas to El Paso and went to the most Mexican Walmart. And what I say most Mexican Walmart, El Paso and Juarez, Mexico, this is a binational community. This is a, a, a community that can only be understood by the interdependency between the two of them. Thousands and thousands of people go back and forth between El Paso, Texas, El Paso and Juarez. So he went this weekend to the most Mexican Walmart and start shooting at Mexicans. And he was, he was selecting them. He was selecting them. It's like that looked like a Mexican start shoot. The only white person that died there died because he was protecting his Mexican wife or Latino wife. Twenty-two people died that day. Twenty-two members of our community died in El Paso. Um, so everything been thrown to us already. Before before that shooting. That shooting didn't happen in a vacuum, wasn't circumstantial, it wasn't random. It was the intended consequence of something else. This year, before the shooting, in El Paso, we saw mothers being separated from their babies, 18-month-old babies while in detention. Children were put in cages. And I'm not overstating that we are there. We see that. Migrant families with children and in, in fathers and mothers, kids and granddads, they were put under a bridge in a rocky ground to sleep there for days, exposed to extreme cold, with no food and with no water, no medication. In that bridge, under that bridge, close to the river, a mother asked for a bottle of milk that he was actually was there and asked the agent to get that bottle of milk to give it to the two-year-old girl. The agent came, grabbed the milk, and threw that milk to the ground. 30 families, that, 30 people that were at that made up detention center under a bridge for, for several days. They were taken to an ICE detention center. They, they, they actually had, has, had, hadn't taken a bath for seven days. What ICE agency did is in El Paso, they put them in the ice cold, cold uh, courtyard, took a water hose as a star, bathing collectively with the clothes on, and then sent to the yeleras, very, very cold, cold rooms. Six children had died or died during the period of six months in border patrol stations and ICE stations. Before that, it was years that we had the situation where children died in detention centers. Right after, we start seeing an increase of migrant, especially Guatemalan migrants, dying in the river, more than even before. Right after that, they implemented, all of this happened in this year, 
I'm talking about one in a span of one and a half years, implemented the zero, zero tolerance policy. That meant in the past, many, many, many years ago, you would cross the border one time, you would be detained and you will be sent back with no record. I mean, you will be detained and sent back because that was the flexibility, a voluntary departure, they call it. But now, since 1996, if you would have crossed the border one time and then you've been deported back to Mexico, but then you want to go back to your family. Because that, is this about family? This is, this, this is the issue about families. Then I would go back, cross the border again. I was deported already. But if they would cut me for that second time, I would be sent to jail for three or 10 years just because I was going back to my family. But in the last year, even if it was the very first time that you crossed the border, you will be criminally prosecuted. So the crime of looking for a better life was being punished. The crime of looking for the American dream is being punished, right? Very heavily. So that was the zero tolerance oppression. This administration stopped accepting asylum seekers that were trying to cross the border legally, as they supposed to, right? I mean, you're coming, you, you showed up at the port of entry, say, I, I, I'm afraid, I mean, something is gonna happen to me or to my family. I'm gonna ask for protection of the United States. And you know what, that being the international standard, but also that being the, the historic standard of the United States to protect people that is fleeing violence. You remember why the pilgrims came to, the, to, 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 to what is now the United States? Because they were fleeing violence. Many other generations came to the United States because they were fleeing violence and economic desperation. But now, you say, no, we are not gonna accept you anymore. And we start rejecting asylum seekers. Asylum seekers, not even, not even just economic migrants. People were turning themselves in. I mean, they were not trying to sneak into the United States. They were just turning themselves in. Massively because the situation of violent economic situations there in Central America. And this administration decided to just <coughs> return them to Mexico, which Mexico in Juarez is a, is a violent city. So, so far, there's been, I believe, there's been more than five migrants that have been returned that have been killed in Mexico. Migrants from Guatemala and El Salvador, et cetera. That happened in this administration. Then we, ha we had the border walls. We had all of the things that I mentioned. So what we have here, it is the evolution, not only of, of a policy, but of the evolution of a narrative. And I'm very concerned about it. And we're very concerned about it. Because honestly, this is not about immigrants. This is not about them. It is about what we are. I mean, what we're doing today, it represents the character of the nation. And before I talk about some of the videos and other things that we're doing, I want to propose this, this, this narrative to you. When you think about the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island, you know what that is, right? What do you think of? What it comes to your mind? Yeah. What else comes to your mind when you talk about the Statue of Liberty and all the silent? About the Emma Lazarus poem. I think it's uh, bringing your huddled masses. Who are the huddled masses? Immigrants. Through Ellis Island, 15 million people came through from Europe. In, in the Statue of Liberty, it was a gift from Europe to the United States because this was an exceptional country. And it was exceptional because of immigrants, and because of migration, right? And the Statue of Liberty in the Ellis Island defined the character of the nation and the ideals of the nation for, for, for many, many years, right? We're a nation of immigrants with a melting pot, with a plurimus unum, all of that was the, the construction of that narrative that defined America as a nation of immigrants, right? 
So this is a challenge. The challenge, what, what I'm saying is that I do believe today that the U.S.-Mexico border, it is the new Ellis Island. Because those immigrants that are coming right now, those are the ones that have been deported, the ones being incarcerated, the ones that are waiting in refugee camps in Juarez, they have the same hopes, aspirations, reasons of those immigrants that came from Europe. The same ones. They are not different. The only difference is that they are immigrants of color coming from the South. So what we are seeing today at the border, when you see the discussions happening at the border, when you see the, all of these horrific things happening at the border, what is really happening, it is a fight for the for soul and the character of this country, how America is going to look like in 50 years. And we're all going to be responsible, not only this administration. We all are going to be responsible, and all, we're all going to be accountable for whatever this country goes, and what, whatever the direction goes. Is, is it going to be a country that incarcerates children, persecute immigrants, build, builds walls? And that is not going to happen at the border. Deploy the army in American soil, or it's going to be a different country that accepts that we are diverse, that we're inclusive, that together we can do it, and at the end of the day, that we're going to be a country that is, that, that, that is going to be, in many ways, driven by immigration. And immigrants would be, rather than a national security threat, an asset to our, to our communities. As it has been in the past. I mean, there is no way that, that we can ignore that, that, that that's what happened in the past. And you are gonna be important in that process. So I'm gonna wrap up in a, doing a couple of things because we need to open questions and answers. And then, can you give a, speak a little bit to what the Mexican reaction has been over time? Did that build up? Uh, <coughs> well, let, let me tell you that the, 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 the experience on, on the, at the border, how, how not only the official Mexican reaction, but but the people's community's reaction. When I, when I arrived to El Paso in the uh, late 80s, uh, you would go to the bridge, the international court, uh, uh, ports of entry, and you will look down the river, and you will see a lot of people at the river. In, because there were these guys with inflatable inner tubes, I don't know how do you call them, that you would pay them one dollar, one dollar, and they would push the two, the two from Juarez and El Paso just to not to get wet, wet and you would pay one dollar. That was the mobility that was happening. They would go to Walmart, buy oranges, and then walk back into Mexico through the port of entry. That was the mobility that happened. That, that, that happened at that time, and uh, in, 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 and obviously, uh, people were using that way to crossing one dollar to cross into El Paso. The same thing happened with other um, nationalities coming from Central America. They did the same. The only thing that I observed at that time from Mexicans and Central Americans <laughs> is that. It was their family members that would come for them and cross them to, into the United States. It was a, that, that, that crossing the border was a, fam, a family issue. I mean, there was, there was not business involved in it. So all of that is gone. You cannot do that anymore because that's a heavily militarized border. But one thing had happened is that this heavy, heavy militarization had created the human smuggling business, which is a big time. So militarization and the, the way that we actually had developed border strategies had created that business in the Mexican side where there were non-existent crime organizations at that time that would cross people. Now they are the only ones that had the capacity to bring people across to extortion of agents or whatever. But you need to pay four, five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars just to go across from Juarez into El Paso. Now, how the Mexican government is responding to it? 
you know, I would say that Mexican government is being nullified in this whole process. There's not going to be resistances. Up to today, there's no resistances on the bad things that are happening at the border. Mexican government is, is doing actually the opposite. He's aligning right now, he's aligning with the current administration to deploy the Mexican army. They call it National Guard. They just changed the uniforms to stop immigrants in Mexico, to contain immigration flows in Guatemala. If you go to Juarez, El Paso, my hometown, you will see that there are Mexican soldiers deployed along the, the river with, heavy, with, with weapons and long rifles running around and stopping children from crossing, from leaving yeah. Mexico into the United States, from crossing the river. So the, the official, it seems to me that the official response of the, the Mexican government is to be aligned with the U.S., but in the worst case, and I think it is happening right now, it happened before, the, the Me Mexico is doing the dirty job of immigration of the United States. You know that Mexico was threatened by Trump with tariffs. And there were two conditions that Trump put for that. I mean, they say, well, if you don't do this, I'm going to impose tariffs, which I think it was bluffing. It was bluffing because the economic damage would be great. I mean, when you see Senator Cruz and Senator Cornyn opposing Trump on this, is, I mean, you say, this is, this is not going to go anywhere, right? It was bluffing. But the new president in Mexico, accepted immediately the conditions which was to deploy them the, the soldiers to, to contain immigration but also to accept the unacceptable is to actually accept that mexico will take care of the refugees not because it's a bad idea but it's because it's taking away the responsibility of the united states by international law to take care of refugees and asylum seekers so i think that's been part of the connection with, with Mexico, unfortunately. Unfortunately, the Mexican government and previous administrations, they had not stand up to all of this heavy militarization. I mean, many of the people that had died at the border, they're Mexicans. People being shot at, they are Mexicans. And you would expect a, a, a more strong reaction of Mexican government say, you know what, I'm going to defend my co-nationals. That hadn't happened, which by the fact, I mean, it takes me to this point. What we're proposing, it is the same thing. I mean, if we have a case of a border patrol that killed a, a, a young teenager in Juarez, but but he was shot at, but he, he was killed in the Mexican side. He they shot the agent shot from the US side, and the, the kid was in the in the Mexican side. And the courts in the United States they say there's nothing that we can do because he died in Mexico even though the shots were coming from the United States. Well, then that agent must be, try, what, must be stand justice and trial in Mexico. Mexico should extradite that agent to judge him, as, as the United States does with Mexicans. That's co-responsibility, but that is another story, anyhow. So, just wrap it up. All of this had happened at the border. But we are being working to reject all of that. El Paso was attacked. El Paso was attacked because what we are as a community, we're a community that had welcome immigrants, a community that opened our hearts, our homes, our churches to uh, asylum seekers, but also we had rejected and protested every anti-immigrant agenda. All the ones that I mentioned, the, all the different st strategies, we had actually mobilized people, organized people. So. In, in, in certain way, El Paso has been punished because of what we are. We are a symbol of resiliency and a symbol of, of welcoming immigrants. In, in this process of organizing, we actually had bring many families together in a border network, as I was mentioned in, our, in, our, in the video. We do a lot of organizing, and we're doing organizing and we create community leaders, we train community leaders not to deal with a specific community issue, but we're dealing with national and international issues. So what we are doing is trying to bring the voices of border communities to the national discussion. Um, so in that process, uh, we've been able to build a community engagement process, a community engagement process 
that has made Border Patrol in our sector. Border Patrol is divided by sectors along the Mexico border. In our sector that covers New Mexico in, in El Paso, we've been able to actually make that Border Patrol accountable. Since we start this engagement, organizing education process, the incidence of abuses with Border Patrol have been decreased from 70% in the year of 2000 to 30% in the year of 2013 because of communities getting organized and responding. So that is the nature of what we are. But at the end of the day, we're inserted in a political fight. At the end of the day, it is a, it's a major national fight. And in the process, we wanted to bring attention to the family separation issue. Because we heard about immigration rates, we have an immigration enforcement, it happened here, it had happened in other places. But what we don't see sometimes is the, the actual impact that that has in our families. Mothers separating from their kids, not in detention, but separate because they are deported to Mexico or to other parts of the Latin America. Or, or spouses being separated. I mean, they love each other. They, they, they are married and then suddenly they are separated by deportation. So we wanted to bring the case of family separation to the national discussion. And we, we actually launched what we call Hacks Not Walls. That, that is an unprecedented event. And I will tell you, we're very proud of it because what we done is the impossible. We, we took over the border for five, or, for five hours. <coughs> and we worked with families to come to the middle of the Rio Grande River, which is mostly dry in downtown El Paso because the water is canalized and goes underground. So we were able to, in the first one, we were able to have 300 families that came together right at the middle of the river. Uh, and again, it's a very powerful event. Uh, we had done it six times. It was suspended because the administration uh, built a wall <laughs> where we were doing the hacks, not walls. It built a huge wall, but we put a lot of pressure now. We're going to do the seventh event on August the 26th. No, October the 26th. Um, we had been able to bring, bring together 1,300 families already. Now, uh, comments. Uh, this event is, is always very difficult for us. Um, and there's a lot of logistics. Uh, we had asked Border Patrol to open their perimeter of security because it's a heavy limit. If you go to the border, you will get arrested on the side of the border. So I was asked them to open the perimeter, perimeter, allow the families, the US side of the border families, to come, thousands of them and do the event. So that only can be understand because of the community organizing that we had done and the power relations that we had built there uh, in that community. But I will actually uh, close it there and any questions, uh, any comments, any critiques, regañadas, <laughs> lo, lo que sea, pues. be captured after the event. And the second, uh, how can you extract uh, some, someone who has been captured and put them to this uh, retention center? Because it's my understanding that they cannot communicate with their families either. So do you know anything about us? Uh, um, the border network is a, the border network, I need to explain the nature of border. Border network is not a group of activists. It's a, co it's a community that is organized, and that's what is making the difference in terms of the relation with Border Patrol. The agreement with Border Patrol, it is that when we actually work with this, is that they would not, they would not be there enforcing anything for those. For that time. But we are responsible of not letting anybody to cross to each side of the border. We border network. So we have our own security protocol. And what you see is, Colors. I mean, why people wearing white shirts? They are from the from the Mexican side, and blue shirts from blue from the U.S. side. Border Patrol would not touch and question anybody that is wearing those blue shirts. They have a number of security, um, how to say, um, details. So border Network, the Border Patrol would know that that person is part of the event. They would not touch them. 
because it's a political issue. I'm saying if they would touch it and break the agreement, then there would be a political mess there. So nothing. We we had to have six events, and nobody had been questioned because we 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 are there all the time. Border Network is there all the all the time. We go inside with those members of the community, and we together go outside of the border. So we stay until everybody goes to their homes, and nothing had happened. So but it is a difficult. It's, it's difficult because we need to. The border patrol wanted to ask us to nobody to cross to each other of the border, but also to not to exchange anything while they are meeting at the middle of the Rio Grande because of customs law. So no pueden entregar what aguacates, chicharrones, ni nada, ni flores. So, so, but it, it is a very tight security protocol that we have. But border patrol doesn't register anybody, doesn't talk to anybody on their families, and doesn't talk, doesn't question anybody in these events. So. In regards to the detention, uh, actually, uh, things in detention are getting very, very complicated. Um, somebody is detained in, in up, up for 24 hours. They, you might not be able to know where they are until they actually up, up, uh, upload to a system that they have uh, a computer system. They need to register that, that person to know where they are. So even if you call an attorney that actually specializes on detention centers, and deten they wouldn't know where your your family member is until until C, uh, the uh, until CDP or in this in this case uh, ICE upload the information of that person to that system to tell you exactly what, yes you can access it uh, attorneys can access that yeah yeah. I have to say for the for the people I've so no, maybe but maybe we thank you so much for another one. For, first of all, thank you. Thank you. But if so, some of you have some questions, yes. Um, I I am also from and, uh, and and I. I work with undocumented migrants uh, from Central America in Apisaco, Tlaxcala. And what we have seen there on the ground is also a lot of xenophobia and a lot of racism against... Uh, the Mexico, yes. ...against people coming from, mainly from Honduras. So from your experience, what, what, what could you tell me to bring back to Mexico to fight against those sentiments of, of, of racism and xenophobia? coming from Mexicans to, uh, to, uh, to Central America? You know, the, 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 this is a very important question because there is a, what I call an issue of historic memory. Yes. Yes. Historic memory means that um, actually you cannot explain Mexico without families, Mexican families migrating to the United States. And all, almost any, anybody in Mexico will not somebody or one of the family members that had migrated to the United States. I mean, that is a that is a fact. So when 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 you have that that Mexican questioning Central Americans, knowing that their families are in the United States as 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 migrants, it doesn't make sense. And doesn't make sense because uh, it seems that we had forgotten. What we had, what we are, also. I mean, and, and this is this is important because it doesn't happen only in terms of of communists re, communists reacting against Central American immigrants in Mexico, but the government of Mexico reacting against Central American communities or Central American Im immigrants in Mexico, and and then you see the Mexican government coming to the United States to try to defend the rights of Mexicans in the United States. Doesn't make sense. They are not consequence. They are. That's not. The, that's, not a, that's not the word. They are not. Um, I mean, they don't have any any, any moral authority. In reality, in this case, the, the Mexican government to come and to say that they're going to defend Mexican uh, Mexicans' uh, national rights in the United States, what they are doing worse things with uh, immigrants from from Central America. So I think the first situation is. We, we need to make that government accountable. I think if, if you see the National Guard of Mexico, La, La Guardia Nacional, going after immigrants and to, after children and families, obviously the population is going to say, well, we support the National Guard. I mean, 
the, the official narrative is that immigrants from Central America and Mexico are, are taking their resources from Mexico, are taking jobs. The same arguments that here in the United States have towards Mexicans. So I think we need to talk more about historic memory, that we are a country of migrants also in Mexico. Um, just uh, Max Pensky, I'm the director of the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention at Dickinson University. So I wanted to follow up a little bit and, and, and ask you two related questions uh, on that theme. One would be, um, in terms of historical memory, uh, Honduras and Guatemala are the two, are two of the larger uh, driving countries for the, the, the current mm -hmm. uh, uh, going. The situation of the war. And, and so, from our perspective, the way, the, the way that we look at Guatemala is a post genocide society, right. where nearly 300,000 Mayan indigenous population mm -hmm. was killed in the 36 years of military action, oh, yeah. which would not have been possible but for the contribution of the United States. So. Um, if you if you look at it from that lens, it's 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 really a, a, a feature of Guatemala mm -hmm. that the, the legacy of, of genocide continues to go on in terms of generating all the risk factors that we tend to look for for the recurrence or the repetition of, of genocidal violence, which is to say uh, low government capacity, poor human mm -hmm. rights, mm -hmm. economic inequality, and so on. So so one of the things that's really interesting about about the border network is whether or not um, from your um, position uh, as a grassroots organization in El Paso, whether or not you find yourself really getting into the, the, the details of Guatemalan history, for example, on your history. Or, so it's, it seems to me like a, I'd love to hear you say more about that, this historical memory as an international memory, as a memory not just of the United States or even not just of Mexico but as a whole. Or the whole regional memory of the yeah. countries whose fates are intertwined. And then just one little question to, to follow up. Um, the, um, you've been reading, we've all been reading lately, uh, a lot of editorials and a lot of opinions that the, the conditions under which um, undocumented migrants are being held in the, in the detention facilities in the El Paso Valley are probably prosecutable as uh, crimes against humanity, depending yeah. on how you look at the evidence. Yeah. And so one question I have is from your perspective, would that matter? Does it? How would it make a difference from for your work, whether or not there was a, some sort of emerging consensus that international crimes were being committed in the, in the detention okay. facilities in El Paso? Okay. Okay. The first question about how do we connect with not only historic memory of Guatemala and other countries, but also how do we m make sure that it's always present in what we do? Because what we do is not only try to actually war with Mexican immigrants. I mean, that is not the work that we do. It is really, it's really try to work and to develop the mechanisms for protection of immigrants, doesn't matter where they're coming from. There are two things that we actually been always talking about in, in honestly, in the national discussion of immigration and borders doesn't become prevalent, which is the root causes of migration. And, and I think that is something that politicians, Newspapers, uh, journalists have actually left outside of the equation in terms of immigration. And what that had produced it is the fact that many people in the United States, or even in Mexico, I would say, do not understand the conditions why Guatemalans are fleeing their country. And, and, and I would say it's the same for the rest of, the, of, of other sending countries. I, th I think the way that we had done this is, is reinserted that discussion and say why people is coming, it is important. And I think wh why we had a presentation from um, uh, a group from Guatemala that came to the border and gave us a presentation about the situation of Guatemala. And they were talking about all of the, the consequences of genocide, of the genocide is still present in Guatemala, very real uh, to the fact that Border Network is working with a couple of activists from Guatemala that are right now in Juarez. We connect them with attorneys and stuff and, and, and other legal support because one of them was one of the it was a it was he was a child when the whole village was killed, even the parents. 
And then the army took him. And, and, and he grew up with the army in one of the uh, cuarteles, right? But then at some point he realized what, what had happened, right? That, that the army had killed many people in, in, his, in his community. And then he started denouncing it. So he started denouncing it. So start getting connections with other people working in environmental issues. And then they were threatened. Their lives was, was threatened because the same people that produced the genocide is still there in, in Guatemala, in power. So they had to flee. They had to flee Guatemala and, and, and they end up in Juarez alone by themselves with no support at all. And, and more importantly, nobody knew their story. They thought that they were just any other immigrants in that sense. I mean, for, the, for, for Americans and for the American policy, anybody, everybody's the same. I mean, it doesn't matter if they have a specific history. So we had used that to, to teach our own members in our own community to say, you know, we need to, we need to, un to understand that there's issues of historic memory, but it's not has, that history is happening right now. The, the, the elements of genocide con continue to happen. So yes, we, 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 we actually insert that as a part of our trainings in, with new leaders, but also we do that in our narrative. In a public narrative, we always talk about the reasons why people is, 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 is leaving the, their own country. So I think that is ha the way that we can do it. I traveled to Guatemala, uh, well, to the border with Guatemala and Mexico to observe how that border wa how was being militarized. And it seems very normal that there are more soldiers along the, the Guatemala-Mexico border in both sides of the border because in Guatemala they always had that. And now they have more, but with the condition that they are stopping immigrants, right, in that sense. So for us, we are horrified by the, by the fact that uh, Mexican soldiers are being used for that. But in Guatemala, they see the soldiers like, okay, this, here they come again. I mean, they are the same ones that they were facing, uh, they, they faced in the past, you know. So your second question was about, sorry. Uh, the second question was, was just seeing whether the kind of work that you do. Ah, yeah. What, yeah. How yeah. would that be affected, yeah, yeah. affected by whether or not there are crimes against humanity? We had, we, I wrote uh, in 2009, I, know, I, I wrote a piece of paper for the Georgetown School of Law Journal. It should be there. What I do criticize the international mechanisms in the way that they relate to the U.S.-Mexico border. I'm talking about a human rights crisis, not only in terms of many people dying, but we are seeing torture in those detention centers. So the fact that we had had not one single statement by these old UN, UN mechanisms condemning that and doing a report on that and calling to action to when the UN has not gotten involved with these issues of, of the, the US-Mexico border. Now, what we, we're being proactive. We, what we did is we filed, we're filing um, a report to the UN in the, in the upcoming um, uh, review process that they have. So we, are, we produce a report that actually encompass all of the different violations, not only torture, but also uh, going from racism, the, the possession of basic, in, in deprivation of basic uh, needs, human needs, uh, illegal detention, all of these things. So we had actually, we're about to submit that. Our hope is that the UN mechanisms would actually bring this to the international discussion. It would be very, very important that they do something. They have not done it so far. So if that happens, I think it's going to, it's going to showcase that human rights in the United States are being violated. It is not happening in China or in Cuba or in Venezuela. It's happening here in the United States. And I think that, is, that, that would be, if that happens, that would set up an important precedent. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, it's kind of relating to the uh, event that you guys had before that was on the screen. What, do you guys have any correspondence from any, any other organizations or human rights groups uh, either across the, the American-Mexico border? Or what we're doing is what we're doing transnational organizing. What that means is that we're working with people in Juarez. Uh, it is very interesting. I mean, I came from Mexico. And I learned some of the social justice issues in Mexico. 
But now we're going back to train people in Mexico about how to organize around human rights. It's, it's very interesting for me. Now that, that means that there's a, a great need for human rights organizing in Mexico. It's not happening. It happened in more, is there's a lot of activism. Activism is like, there's a, many organizations. When I say organizations, it's just a group, of, a, a, a group of people, and many times it's not the impacted community that is, that is getting organized. It's just like a, people with good faith and uh, goodwill. But at the end of the day, my concern in Mexico also, not only also in the United States, is that immigrants are being seen as victims or just anybody seen as uh, poor people is seen as a victim and as, as, as the subject for change. And for us, it's very important to do that. So what we have done is we've been, we've been doing human rights trainings in Southern Mexico, in Veracruz, in Puebla, in Oaxaca. We had done other training. So we are, we're trying to train impacted communities so they can actually self-organize and, and have better capacity to respond to this, all, all of these situations. We do have formal relations with a number of organizations in, in, in Mexico, Sin Fronteras, este, El Colegio de la Frontera Sur, Colegio de la Frontera Norte, uh, Frontera Libre. Ahorita no, no me suena, pero el, 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 el Instituto Mora, más en el sur, están así una serie de casas del migrante. So, uh, oh, I mean, we do work, we have a relation with them. But I think what we are pushing is to do more organizing, build more community structures, not only for, for immigrants in, ta in transit, which, which is going to be important that whenever they get to the United States, they know their rights, but also sending communities in Mexico. I mean, uh, because uh, at the end of the day, you know, everybody would agree that uh, a, a lot of the problems of immigration, ha they happen, or they, the fact that immigration happens a good part of that is because people don't find the conditions in their own country to live with dignity and with rights. So I think it's very important to have that vision that is not only about the United States. I mean, how people have been mistreated in the United States and, and, and immigrants in the United States. It's also about the conditions of those countries. And in those countries, we had to change as equally. The United States has to change to have a, 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 a better relationship with, with Latin America and, and with the United States. Um, a lot of what you do in addition to working with other community members is negotiating these very fragile political relationships. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because it seems like you're at some point in a no-win situation um, in the sense that your, your colleagues perhaps have critiques about the relationships you have to develop with Border Patrol for the in order to get this work done. And I wonder how do you navigate that? And how do you um, kind of keep this two side the two sides of your relationship um, functional? Yeah. Both with the coalition and with these political figures and bureaucrats that you have to work with in order to do these various events. Let me say first that we do respect any organization is trying to advance justice for people and for immigrants. I think everybody has to have, not everybody, ha, everybody has to be doing the same thing. But, um, but Border Network, myself, we are only accountable to the community that we work with. We are not accountable to anybody else. And I, I'm being very honest. I mean, you tell me I'm accountable to, to that other organization or to that other institution or I say no because my mandate comes for the communities that I work with. Every year, our members, hundreds, thousands, come together in, in, an, in an annual gathering. And, and, and what they do there is that they define the priorities, not me, and they evaluate my work. I mean, they actually I sit in front of hundreds of people in a, in a little chair where they are actually telling me what things, what things I did right, but also what things I didn't do that well, you know, because I had to ask them every year to that members, to those members, whether they would give me the vote of trust and confidence or not. So they can just say, Fernando, you are not doing what you're supposed to do, be, be doing with us, so you're gone. So for us, that means we are creating a democratic process internally, but also an accountability process. I'm not criticizing this, but I'm going to say it. Sometimes it's easier 
not to be accountable, but to, to yourself. I mean, if you had an organization that has like a two or three or five people, then you can decide whatever you want to do with those three or five people. But you had hundreds of people in thousands of families. That doesn't work like that. I mean, you need to have a process where they had to say what, what you had to do. So saying that, we, we were seeing a, a situation of, of, of a culture of abuse. I mean, abuse were happening at home, at work, and in the streets with, uh, with Border Patrol. In specifically with Border Patrol, what, was the, what had been the strategy in the past with m most of the of our advocate organization is, is denouncing Border Patrol. Is, Border Patrol is, is evil. Yes, we agree with that. Border Patrol is bad. Yes, we, we need to, we had done that multiple times. We do it systematically. But what we realize is that then, that denunciation by itself didn't create any changes, real, real changes of abuse in our community. So what we did, we took that step. Uh, I remember how this happened, actually. We had, we released an abuse documentation report publicly. We blamed Border Patrol for that 70% that I was mentioning. And Border Patrol was so eager to talk to us because they don't like bad publicity. They are, pol they are a political institution. But in this case, they were seeing Border Network not as a group of activists, but an organized community. So, um, so we use that opportunity. We sit down with Border Patrol, and we use what we call in, um, pressure and dialogue strategy. A pressure and dialogue. That 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 means that means that always one, always the other will be uh, uh, relevant depending on the situation. So what we did is we sit down with them, and this is what we did with Border Patrol. We would, we didn't sell out everything. I mean, didn't sell sell ourselves out. We sit down with them and say, this is the this is the issues. This is the, violation, the violations. How are you locally gonna change that? I'm not gonna wait until Congress pass new, new laws. How you are gonna be accountable to the Constitution of the United States, which is the main uh, guideline in that sense. So we train Border Patrol agents of constitutional and civil rights. We train them, we want to train them in master training. We force them to do assessment of use of force. We force Border Patrol to actually make very public the complaint process. And also, we, can, we, we force Border Patrol to say, this is very important in, in, in camera, in this community, joint community forums, to say that they would not enter homes if they didn't have a search warrant or the permission of people. And, they, and also, we have Border Patrol chiefs saying, and somebody doesn't want to answer my questions, if I go to you and you don't answer my questions on immigration, well, that is fine because you have the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. So we were educating Border Patrol in practice, but also our communities, how to defend themselves. The fact is this, the results are undeniable. Undeniable because any metric show that between 2000 and 2010, there was a dramatic decrease from 70 to 30% of incidents of abuse because we use the same methodology every year. Hundreds of documenters going to the community, filling up the same documentation for so consistently we're being using it throughout the year. So we had the way to measure it, right? But put, by 2010, 2013, that was like an exceptional campaign because we did the same. We launched the campaign. Uh, we were looking for ICE, Border Patrol, uh, Customs, local police, all of these agencies, abuses, potential abuses, and results start coming down. The cases start coming down. There was not a single verifiable case from Border Patrol, a single one. Not because they didn't exist, but because of this model and because this metric, we were able to reduce the incidence of abuse to a fact that Border Patrol in that region at that time wasn't the greatest concern of our community. So if you, if you tell me that, that that is selling out or that is, you know, I prefer to do that. I prefer to actually deliver something to my communities like that. And, and when we see Border Patrol, yes, they are evil, but at the end, they are there and they are not going anywhere, right? So that is that could be my answer. How, how do you empower such a vulnerable population against the system that yeah. is clearly not caring about human rights, UN treaties, they just throw it out the window? I mean, they, they bluntly, they, they, they bluntly disregard their own laws, the international law, against this, this great beast of a system. Yeah. Yeah. 
how do we empower yeah. such a vulnerable yeah. population? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it seems simple. It is not simple, but I'm going to try to explain it. Uh, in, in, the, in the mindset, in, in the minds of, of our members of, of, of our community, many of them are immigrants, right? And when I say immigrants, is that we work with families that had mixed legal status. Some, some in the family is a U.S. citizen, somebody is a resident, somebody is, is undocumented. But it's just one family, right? So whatever happens to a member of the family impacts everybody. So that's why our membership, membership is a family membership in that sense. But what we do, we go, we go through a process of creating consciousness. This is, this is very important because we don't provide services. We don't fill up papers. We don't... We don't give food or water or shelter. There are other organizations that are doing that. What we are doing for years already is building the capacity of those communities to fight back. But how do we do that? You know, when, when somebody, in, it's not, this is not only immigrants. In general, people living at, living at the border, they are being told time after time that they don't have rights. That in any case, if you have any rights, they're going to be individual rights. You need to defend them yourselves, you know. So the system creates that situation, fear, but also the individualization of rights. I mean, there are your rights, but if you're okay, doesn't matter if your neighbor is it's not okay, you're okay. So that is the mentality. So what we go is, is we go to that psyche of the people through our training process and say, you know what, the first thing that we need to recognize is that, that what, it, what you've been told is, is a lie. That you don't have rights, that you don't have, that's a lie, that's a lie. That's the way that had, had and we get a number, of, a number of examples. I mean, when they said that uh, 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 African-Americans uh, community, uh, slaves were, uh, what is it, what was four-fifths of, uh, of, of human beings, they said it like that because they wanted to take the humanity out, away from that person. So that person would be sold, abused, and a slave. And that person itself, himself, would not be considered a human being. So they want to take the concept of humanity with you. So when they tell, when they tell us that we are illegal aliens, like we're with somebody from Mars, right? It's because you are not a human being. So for us, in this, in this process of organizing, we do two things. One of them is destroying individuality in, 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 when you fight for rights. I say, what we say is, instead of fighting yourself, come together and do it as a community. So building communities is an affront to this society when, when they are telling, the, telling you that only individuality works, right? So building community is one aspect of resistance. And we had dedicated to build that process of bringing families together. They go to these human rights committees that they mentioned. Human rights committees is a neighborhood committee that families go like if they were going to church every week. So it is already in their calendars. Every week they show up and they talk about the concerns, about the problems, about the solutions, about the campaigns, the border network. So that is a way where, where they connect and build a community. But the second thing is what I call the internalization of rights. So the only way that you're going to fight fear and abuse, we do this exercise when we actually ask everybody in this room to consider themselves that they live in a different society and to look at each other's eyes equally in dignity and rights. So those practices, those exercises of imagining a better society, but also consider themselves as a human being, I mean, recovering humanity is what actually had made possible for us to actually get leaders in the, develop in our community and start fighting back against the monster. It, 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 it's, it's a very slow process. It's not massive. This is not a mobilization. This is changing consciousness to actually give, them, give the people hope. This is what we sell people, if you want to. I, I would say just in those colloquial terms, we don't, we don't give them services, but we tell them, if you come together and you recognize yourself as a, as a human being, you can go beyond this and you can create a better society. So that is, we're building that consciousness to, for people to resist. And that's what it starts. I mean, that's what really changes starts. It starts in the minds of people rather than just in one mobilization. And then we do the mobilizations. <laughs> but I think I tried to summarize the process that actually take.
take, take, take a while. Thank you so much. Gracias. Thank you.